Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from TR2 World Studios in Istanbul. On today's show, we'll check out Istanbul's Mamut Art Project, where 50 up-and-coming creative talents are making their debut, and see how barriers are being broken down in Berlin through dance. But first... In Praise of Patty, a new documentary unveils the mystique behind one of rock and roll's most enduring icons. When Dali met Duchamp, two icons of 20th century art under one roof. An unusual show featuring two of the 20th century's most iconic artists is on display in the United States. The works of Salvador Dali and Marcel Duchamp can be seen together in an exhibition at the Dali Museum in Florida. But as Steve Mort reports, displaying the two artists' contrasting styles alongside each other is considered by some to be a daring move. So this is the great accomplishment of Marcel Duchamp in the early part of his career. This may be a Marcel Duchamp work, but it's on display at a museum dedicated to a very different artist, Salvador Dali. They really do seem to represent completely different traditions of art. Marcel Duchamp, for a while, was associated with Neo-Impressionism leading into Cubism, and then at that very particular moment of uh, 1913, he moved on to challenge basic notions of what art is all about. Salvador Dali, moved towards almost a Renaissance style of painting. Exactly the painting of Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael, which seems to be what Marcel Duchamp was protesting. So why would these two artists be on show side by side? Despite very different artistic styles, Dali and Duchamp shared an enduring friendship, which curators here at the Dali Museum hope this exhibition will highlight. They both shared a passion for chess playing, and there's many moments in Dali's work where Marcel Duchamp is referenced, and there's some projects by Marcel Duchamp that seemingly involve Dali. So this exhibition brings these ideas together. Several examples of the relationship between Dali and Duchamp have been gathered from collections around the world. One of the key pieces by Marcel Duchamp is his LHOQ with the Mona Lisa. Duchamp made several versions of LHOQ, letters which, when pronounced in French, sound like a phrase meaning she has a hot bottom. What Marcel Duchamp did is he drew a goatee and a mustache, so it's very much a kind of schoolboy sort of prank against um, the tradition of art. And then we move into Salvador Dali, and with a tip of the hat to his friend Marcel Duchamp, instead of the goatee, we just have the classic Dali mustache. LHOQ is part of a series of works by Duchamp he called Ready Mates featuring everyday utilitarian objects, in this case a postcard reproduction of the Mona Lisa. He took a, a urinal, put it on its side, gave it a name, which was the fountain, and signed it. And in those three steps, he feels that this has constituted the art process. And then later in the 1930s, Dali responds to that. He starts creating his own objects, and one of his most successful is the lobster telephone. Famous works by both artists are part of this exhibition, including Duchamp's Large Glass and Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. In total, more than 60 pieces are on display here at the Dali Museum through the end of May. Steve Moore, TRT World, St. Petersburg, Florida. Joining me now from Lexington, Virginia, is art historian Elliot King. He has done extensive research on surrealism in the 20th century and is a leading expert on the work of Salvador Dali. Thank you so much for joining me today, Elliot. Now, we just heard a little bit about uh, the bond that uh, Dali and Duchamp shared. Uh, what can you tell me about their relationship? Well, they're generally perceived as very, very different artists, of course. Uh, Duchamp is, tends to be more of the non-retinal conceptual artist. Dali is certainly the consummate craftsman with his precise style of painting. And I think what this exhibition really shows is that they had not only a friendship, but really a, a really interesting collaboration in terms of subject matter. Both of them were interested in science and eroticism, perspective. Uh, so there were a number of connections that I don't think many people would have thought of uh, these two artists really sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, from an artistic uh, perspective, how did their styles differ? 
their styles really couldn't be more different for the most part. Uh, beginning around uh, 1914, Duchamp began pursuing what he called non-retinal art. So he was interested in the concept, what he called the gray matter behind an artwork. Whereas Dali went to art school. He was a, uh, an academically trained painter. He was always interested in copying artists like Vermeer and Velasquez. And so he was really interested in the retinal side versus Duchamp, who was much more the, the conceptual artist. The, uh, the comparison between the two works, visually, they'll look very, very different. And I think that's one of the things about this exhibition is that they really don't look like two artists that ought to be in the same exhibition, but you really have to dig a little deeper to understand why they're there. Mm -hmm. Well, is it true that Duchamp was more about uh, thinking about art and proposing ideas, uh, whereas Dali was the exact opposite? I wouldn't say that Dali was the opposite in terms of concept, because actually Dali is very, very thoughtful in, in so many of his works. He was interested in nuclear physics, in relativity, in mysticism, religion. And so uh, there are a lot of really profound ideas behind uh, even the soft clocks of the persistence of memory, the uh, famous painting of the Museum of Modern Art. But uh, I think that Duchamp is certainly seen as the more intellectual of the two. And in a way, this exhibition, I think, puts them a little bit more on an even keel, begins to look at Dali as a more conceptual artist. And in fact, Duchamp is a little bit more of an aesthetic artist than we might normally think of him. Well, is there a specific example that you can give us of how uh, both the artists have influenced each other? Sure. Um, well, Duchamp's last work, actually, the Aton Donné, that's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, it had been uncovered fairly recently that Dali actually helped him work on that. And that was a piece that was almost entirely done in secret. Duchamp didn't claim to do art basically after 1920. And so uh, Dali was probably one of the few people in the world who knew what Duchamp was actually doing. Um, at the same time, I might think of the ready-mades that Duchamp did, where he took, say, a urinal uh, in 1917 and presented as an artwork. That's basically taking an object from mass culture and elevating it to the, the level of art because he's changing the context. But Dali actually does that as well in surrealist objects. Uh, his lob lobster telephone, for instance, uh, is basically originally an actual lobster that was basically stuck to a telephone. And in a way, that's always seen as a surrealist object, but once you put it next to a ready-made, you realize that there's a lot of similarities between the two. Well, why exactly uh, are these two artists still very relevant today? Well, Duchamp is certainly one of the most relevant artists of the second half of the 20th century going into the 21st. If the beginning of the 20th century was owing mostly maybe to Picasso, Duchamp really emerged, particularly in the 1960s, as the father of conceptual art, the idea that really anything can be art and it's the artist's choice that, that makes that. And many artists, uh, contemporary artists, have followed in that stead, people like Tracy Emmett, uh, Damien Hirsch. Uh, speaking of somebody like Damien Hirsch, though, there's also that influence of Dali, because Dali was one of the first artists to really elevate himself as a brand, to become a superstar celebrity artist, uh, influencing people like Andy Warhol, uh, Jeff Koons. And so there the contemporary art world is so heterogeneous now that we have lots of different inspirations. And I think that many people will tend to look at Duchamp as really the artist who has the biggest influence. But I think in the background, Dali is actually there. And many contemporary artists will concur that there is a style, there's a, a pomp and bravado that uh, the Dali had in his own time that we still see in contemporary art today. Mm -hmm. Well, they're two absolutely amazing artists in their own unique ways. Art historian uh, Elliot King, Thank you so much for speaking to us on Showcase today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Singer, songwriter, poet, Patti Smith is one of those performers who's almost impossible to put a label on. From punk rock to spoken word, her growly voice, gangly, gender-neutral appearance, and razor-sharp lyrics helped define a generation and changed the way women were expected to rock. And now, more than 40 years after her debut album, a documentary aims to capture the white-hot heat of Smith's live performances. In the medieval night. Way before the release of her first album, Horses, musician Patti Smith already had a cult following from her acclaimed live performances around New York City. Releasing the record in 1975, she instantly won high praise from international media outlets and gained global popularity. The release also has significance in that it helped shape the female punk rock movement. Started 
Upcoming documentary, Horses, Patti Smith and her band, aims to bring the raw power of the veteran performers coming out record to the 21st century. It celebrates and captures the 40th anniversary tour, honouring her acclaimed debut. According to the director of the production, this documentation of Smith is essential viewing for fans. This is a, a strictly a concert film. Um, it's a performance in World, at the World Turn in LA, and it's just strictly a, a, a horse's album from start to, be, to finish with, uh, 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 what's the last? Uh, My Generation is the last song, which is an On the Horses album that we just did. We want to throw that at the end. Um, there's some, uh, between some of the songs, I, I, it's Patty and I sort of our intimate little moments and stuff that we put in the middle of each, a little bit between a couple songs and, you know. But visually, visually, for me, it's a stellar, stellar performance. The always self-critical cult musician says she's happy with the result of her collaboration with filmmaker Spring. I'm excited because it's just what we do. It's a, it's, it's a very raw film. And um, I've worked with Stephen before. We did a, a Dream of Life together, a documentary. So this is our second uh, uh, work together. Um, I'm happy with it, happy to be here. It's uh, such a nice little film and to have such a big honor for, for our little film is wonderful. Anticipation of the release keeps building as word spreads that horses, Patti Smith and her band will finally meet its audience in May. Still to come on Showcase, a lot of dancing and a gallery in the green. From colorful creatures to lonely gas stations and hidden faces, the Mamut Art Project takes over Istanbul's Küçük Çiftlik Park. And Debke for beginners bringing Syrian dance to the studios of Berlin. And now for a quick look at some other stories that have landed on Showcase's radar, beginning with how a famous Hollywood director is taking on Washington when it comes to its Middle East policy. It's so clear and will be so clear in history and it doesn't matter who's president, whether it's Mr. Bush, Mr. Obama, or Mr. Uh, Trump. America will break any treaty, it has to, to get what it wants. But in this case, there is no treaty, we're outlaws. We're doing something that is outlawed internationally. We, didn't, we had no permission to invade Iraq from the UN, we did it, and we continue to do this. Oscar-winning filmmaker Oliver Stone has harshly criticized America's involvement in the Middle East during a conference in Iran's Fedger Film Festival. The director of the politically charged movies such as Nixon, Looking for Fidel and Snowden commented on the war in Syria and accused France and the U.S. administration of colonialism and imperialism. Award-winning director Quentin Tarantino and actor Leonardo DiCaprio have delivered new details about their upcoming film. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a crime thriller set during the Manson murders of the 1960s. This week at CinemaCon in Las Vegas, Tarantino announced that the new movie will be the closest to his 1994 cult classic, Pulp Fiction. Brad Pitt will be joining DiCaprio in the film, which will be released next summer. Set in Istanbul's Küçük Çiftlik Park, the Mamut Art Project is something truly unique. The entire event is dedicated to introducing talented emerging artists to collectors, curators and galleries. And it's also introducing parties of school children to the wonder of art. Carrie Alexandra lets us know what to expect. 50 budding contemporary artists are showcasing their work in Istanbul this weekend. 
There are no restrictions on what the artist can submit, so the work on display is wonderfully varied and vibrant. From pirate ghost ships carved from wood and animal bones, and colourful creatures that look like something out of a lovingly illustrated children's book, to striking sketches of hidden faces and cold eyes that tell a story. The works haven't been displayed anywhere else, so even the most seasoned art lovers and collectors can look forward to some surprises. A panel of five new judges are chosen every year to select the participants, adding another level of variation and diversity to the project. For more on the Mammut Art Project, I'm joined in our studio by Daily Sabah reporter Matt A. Hansen. He is an arts writer and culture journalist who has his reviews about the arts published in different parts of the world, including here in Istanbul and in the Middle East. Thank you so much for joining me today, Matt. Now, what are the different uh, kind of art genres that we can find at the Mammut Art Project? You'll find uh, a, a, a range, a great range, paintings, uh, installations, sculptures, uh, sketches, textile, uh, video art, animation, um, just about everything, I mean, possible. Contemporary, uh, traditional. Yes, and, and new takes on these uh, styles and mediums, um, yes. Well, tell me a bit about the works of artists like Banu Ural, Ilkeshain, and Eda Ash. Uh, Banu Ural is very interesting. She's uh, one of the older artists. Most of the artists were born in the 90s, very young. Um, and she has taken her heirloom uh, textiles from her family and she sketched on them beautiful, uh, very sweet, innocent sketches. Uh, it's a uh, wonderful series that she's uh, been doing over the last year specifically for Mahmoud. Uh, the other one, Ilki Shahin, uh, she does a very uh, unique installation where uh, the viewer walks through uh, a, a foam passageway uh, it's, I, I've never seen anything like it in my years from New York, Istanbul, all over the world uh, looking at installation art. It's wonderful. Um, you have uh, Eda Ar, I believe. Mm -hmm. Eda Ar, uh, yep. Uh, she's um, one of the performance artists. And this year, uh, Mahmoud Art is really pioneering performance art, Istanbul, really all over the world, to sell uh, re-performance rights. Uh, of performing artists in the city uh, within the affordable art market of the emerging artists uh, and their colleagues around the world uh, in this field. And, and that's one of the special things about Mahmoud's art. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, she's What exactly do they do during uh, the performance? Uh, yes, art. so she's, uh, she's, do she's doing a sound installation with a Belgium-based uh, composer, musician named, uh, her name is Anne van der Star. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, together they're creating an, an interactive sound installation. I don't know if anyone knows the Dream House in New York, but you basically walk through the sound and the sound is changing based on your perspective in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a unique sound installation. Uh, so it will be there uh, in the next couple days, I believe. It sounds very interesting. Now, how exactly does the team of the Mammut Art Project choose the, which works of which artists go on display? So there are a thousand, about plus, um, entries, submissions over the last year. Uh, Fifty were chosen. These are first exhibiting artists. They're emerging artists uh, right out of school or maybe have never really entered the professional realm. Uh, but these these artists are very serious about their careers, and you're and you're seeing people who are taking from tradition within the university track or within very independent spheres, mm -hmm. uh, or people who are artists who are just really coming up with things that you 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 won't see anywhere else, and it's fascinating, you know, what's going on there. So. The Mammut Art Project does connect emerging artists with collectors and galleries, but what are some other benefits that they have by uh, taking part in this art project? That's correct. These artists are all unrepresented. 
So that's the thing is that you can go all over to any gallery anywhere and you won't see these artists. They, are, they will now enter that realm of art collection and art sa uh, sale. Uh, for the next four months following this uh, show until Sunday, uh, this art fair, uh, they will be represented by Mammut Art, who uh, founded by the Cohen sisters, Saren and Ekin, um, and uh, through their uh, financial uh, direction and uh, the, all of the contacts that sprawl throughout the city and everyone involved will be you know, on their side, basically, these 50 artists, uh, so that all of this new work really becomes a part of uh, Istanbul art scene and, and beyond. You know. Well, Matt, the Mammut Art Project opened today and will continue until the 29th of April Thank you so much for coming on our set today. You're welcome. My pleasure. <music> Fleeing war at home, arriving in a foreign country, and having to build an entirely new life. All of these things are far from easy. But for two Syrian men now living in Berlin, music and dance was their way of not only surviving, but thriving. This is their story. Medhat Aldabal and Ali Hassan, two Syrian refugees in Berlin since 2015. Even though they lived on the same street in Damascus, they'd never met before, and it was music that brought them together. They've already been involved in several cultural projects across Germany, and now they're teaching locals the traditional Arabic dance, Dad Gay. We have become a part of this city. We have been here for two or three years, and we know the city and the streets very well. We have a lot of friends and memories in the city, and this gave us something like a duty to get through the learning stage of being here and begin to introduce ourselves to the city. To find the balance between giving and taking, and that's how we had the idea to present our culture, music, and dance. We wanted to do this, and that's how we came up with the idea to teach Dabke. Alhamdulillah, it was a lot of fun today. One, two, three, four. Medhat Aldabal, who studied classical dance in Damascus, says dancing makes him feel at home. We want to be together and dance together. Germans and people from other cultures joined us. Everyone can join. We don't care about color, religion or politics, language or nationality. All are welcome. We just want to be together, love each other and understand each other. The moment when we dance and you see the smiles and you look at their faces and see the smiles in their eyes, it's a very beautiful thing. Forty Berliners come together for this workshop, which is open free of charge to everyone. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm a dancer, actually, it's, it's uh, my profession. And I come from the folklore, like the very first dance I made, uh, it was five years flamenco. And uh, this brings me back to my roots. <laughs> This dance studio in Berlin not only offers plenty of moves and laughter, it's also breaking down barriers between locals and newcomers. That's all the time we have left for this edition of Showcase. Check out our YouTube channel if you'd like to see more of our coverage of the global art scene. But before signing off, we leave you with an ode to the world's most famous blossom, whose delicate beauty and seductive smell have captivated artists and aesthetes for a millennia. Until next time, I'm Efnan Han. Bye for now.